The following is an address delivered by Dr. Moda McDonald Bain to the Universal Center, ESCOM Auditorium, Johannesburg, September 19, 1944, revealing the basic principle for solution of personal problems in world reconstruction. It is a very great pleasure to be back here in Johannesburg. I recollect my first visit ten years ago. I was then a Lone Star Ranger, but nevertheless soon became acquainted. Now I return to receive this hearty welcome from this very finely established and active center in Johannesburg and I see before me tonight many familiar faces. World Tour Universal Science Centers, which I have established in many cities all over the world, are doing magnificent work. In London, during my last series of lectures, the halls were crowded to capacity, many people being turned away each night. In America and other countries, thousands of people attended the lectures and classes, and I have just come from Australia, where I spoke in the town halls at each of the big cities of Melbourne, Sydney, Adelaide, and Perth. These halls were also crowded to capacity, many people being unable to be seated accommodation. People all over the world are eager to know the truth which can set them free. They are no longer content with half-truth, they want the whole truth. Journey to Tibet My visit to Tibet was perhaps one of the greatest events in my life. Perhaps some of you have heard about the masters of the Far East. In India there are many mendicants who profess to practice yoga and various other types of phenomena. But these people must not be mistaken for the real masters, who never display or advertise themselves, but live and work upon such exalted planes, and are able to come in contact with the aspiring desires and ideals of the sincere student to whom the masters then reveal themselves. Through correct understanding, the miracles of 2,000 years ago are possible today, because the same laws which were in operation then are in operation today. The same God that existed then exists now. When Jesus, the master, said, before Abraham I am. He showed that the individualization of the infinite spirit in man was existing from eternity to eternity, and by completing his great demonstration, commencing with his experience on the cross and the so-called physical death, he proved the continuation of that same life which existed before Abraham I am. And this same spirit life throbs and pulsates and through all people and is a life with all things and the states in the universe. In bringing the message of the liberating truth and the wisdom of the masters to the world, I have combined both the individual and the collective aspect because it is the individual who gives meaning and the purpose to all the collective states of human existence. It is important for the individual to become vitally aware of his place in the scheme of things, that he understands that no lasting improvement in human relationship can result until the individual realizes the indivisibility between himself and his fellow men. The individual's realization of the truth gives a firm foundation for his own well-being and progress, and this is the unshakable rock upon which collective progress and well-being can be founded. My journey over the Himalayas into Tibet was guided and directed in a most wonderful way, but tonight I am not going to dwell too long in that aspect because I wish to deal with how the master teachings of the inner sanctuaries may be applied to the practical daily states of every man's life. The practical ability to establish personal and collective well-being is, after all, the real reason and purpose behind the whole understanding of truth and the teaching of these masters are the very personal value to each individual. Visit to a Tibetan Adept I visited the isolated monastery of Ling Mutang, the abode of Genshi Rinpoche, the great Tibetan Adept. A Tibetan adept is one who is master of the forces of nature. This monastery lies well beyond the great range of the Himalaya mountains, and no one is allowed to enter without special invitation. I arrived at a hut which provided accommodation for the night before I crossed the 16,000-foot pass which separated me from the valley and the monastery of Ling Mutang. After partaking of supper and dismissing my bear, I closed the door and sat down beside the fireside, thinking of the events of the past day, recollecting and recording the highlights. During my reverie in the dim glow of the firelight, the figure of a man gradually began to form before me, dressed in the robe of a Tibetan lama, his features those of a handsome Mongolian. So clear was his vision as to represent the actual presence of a man whose face was lit up with a smile and whose presence radiated an atmosphere of intense welcome and filled the room with elevated vibrations of joyful peace and thrilling exultation, and then gradually merged into the shadow whence he came, but leaving behind him that wonderful presence which filled the room like a benediction. On awakening next morning, still deeply aware of the heightened feeling caused by the previous night's experience, I went out to view the dawn. The sky was blue, not a cloud. 
the rays of the sun rising from behind the great mountains were broken into such a display of color as to be almost indescribable. But this scene can be imagined when you view a glorious sunset here in South Africa. Just imagine the stars shining in brilliant luster, adding their beauty to this magnificent display of color, sparkling and mingling with another while the rays of the rising sun spread like the vast rainbow in all directions, reflected from the sun-kissed, ice-clad mountain. As the veiling mantle of mist rose from the valley, there in the distance, but appearing near, stood the monastery of Ling Mutang. Some weeks before I set out on my journey, and whilst I was at the place called Kalimpong, a stranger came to see me. He was the master Geshi Thudru, who came to welcome and direct me. In greeting, he put his hand upon my shoulder, and I felt as if my whole body were charged with a mighty electric current. He said to me, You are welcome, my son. It was a queer sensation to have a stranger telling me the principal facts of my life from boyhood onwards. He said, You have come a long way, impelled not entirely by your own desire to find the hidden mysteries of life. There is an intelligence that guides the stars and planets in their path so accurately that not one of the millions loses its path. The same guiding intelligence is directing the course of your life. He instructed me to go to the monastery of Ling Mutang. There I would find the great Geshe Rinpoche, who was expecting me, and who was to be my friend, guide, and teacher for the present. As I wandered down the valley, I could see this monument of mystery secluded in the mountainside. I stood and looked at it for some time, and wondered how such a massive building could have been built in the rock face of a mountain. After climbing the steep rocky steps, I reached the massive doors of the monastery, which were open to receive me. I was led through many halls until I reached the door, paneled in gold. At the side hung a piece of material threaded with gold beads and ended with a gold tassel. The lama who was conducting me pulled this, and I could hear a gong clanging faintly inside. The door opened. I entered, and there stood Genchi Rimpok, this master of the force of nature, the very face that had appeared to me the night before. The meeting had a tremendous effect upon me. I can almost feel a sensation now. He welcomed me with a kindly smile and radiated the wonderful power that I experienced the previous evening. We talked for a while on things of interest, including the world I had come from. He spoke perfect English, and told me that he had traveled in many countries in his younger days, where he had learned and experienced many things, and then he returned to be a teacher of the inner sanctuaries. He had mastered the art of astral projection, and was able to move in different parts of the world, helping people often unknown to them. Under the guidance and instruction of this great teacher, the first seven weeks of my stay were occupied with concentrated study and training, and then I was obliged to move into the next phase for further instruction. Geshe Rimpok's Conclusion Genshi Rimpok's parting words were in the form of a kindly command. The people of the world have failed to understand and practice the teaching of the Master Christ given so long ago. Instead of realizing the oneness of all life as expressed in his words, I and the Father are one, they have set Jesus up as an image of worship, and instead of applying his teaching to their lives, and so they have telescoped Jesus and all he stood for far beyond human reach. Man must clear away this fog of illusion before he can claim his true birthright. There are two different sects of lamas in Tibet, the red and the yellow. The yellow are strictly mystical, while the red enjoy the practice of ritual, pomp, ceremonies, and display. Consequently, the master and teachers who have the good of humanity at heart come from the yellow sect. The word lama means superior one, and strictly speaking, means the abbot of the lamastery. A child enters the monastery at about seven years of age. A strict examination is made mentally, physically, and any defects will bar his entry. Deep meditation is used to ascertain the child's degree of evolvement and to decide the tutor best suited to advance the student upon the path of life. Progress is made step by step until he is fit to enter into the advanced services of the monastery. Before this takes place, he asks permission from the abbot to do so and passes through an initiation. His head is shaved and only a tuft of hair left on the top. He presents himself clad in the meanest of garb, that of a beggar, before the assembled monks in a temple hall, and imitates that he expects the life of a lama freely of his own choice. The abbot then cuts the remaining tuft of hair, and he is given a religious name by which henceforth he is known. He takes the seat which is appointed to him, and he is taught after deportment pertaining to his office. His studies continue. After some years, if he desires to penetrate the inner secrets, he is attached to a teacher of the higher order. 
he must master metaphysics and the more important sacred literature. So he advances until he has completed the instruction available in the monastery when he asks leave to find a master who will take him further along the path of wisdom. Permission is never withheld for such a worthy desire, and he leaves the monastery with only as much food and raiment as he can carry on his back. To weather the storms in the Himalayas, where there is no hope of shelter, is a test for the stoutest heart. And the facing of these hardships forms part of the trial to prove whether the student is worthy and to comply what he has learned. On commencing his advanced teaching, no time is lost in his instruction, which is to free his mind from all illusion and shadows. It is a strange feeling to look into one's own mind and examine all that there is. The student is directed to analyze all his reactions, and he soon finds that his mind is filled with self-created images which are supplementary to himself, having no power of their own. They are motivated by the power given them by the person. Some Vital Points in Training He has shown that human thoughts and reactions are largely to fear, worry, doubt, and ignorance. There must be ascended by concentration of his real self as entirely separate from his thoughts, feelings, or ideas of mind and body. He has shown that these things are not his real self. He sees the falsity of human thinking. This is the vital point in his training. He develops a one-pointedness in regard to life and a power of concentration and a direct ability almost completely unknown to the outside world. He is no longer a slave to his thoughts and the conditions about him. He frees himself and stands at the door which opens into that life which is beyond all things, even himself. Yet he knows himself to be one with it. He is directed to control the functions of his body, the beat of his heart, the circulation of his blood. His body becomes a keen instrument and responds to his direction. His mind is alert, there is no confusion in it, and both mind and body are tuned to obey his slightest command. He finds he is able to control his environment and uses the power every person possesses, but of which few are aware. He learns to love everything, condemn nothing, nor injure any living thing. In short, his training is the realization and recognition of his true spirit self, plus the cultivation and control of his mind and his body. He sees in everything the mighty intelligence that responds to his direction, the same intelligence which acts within himself he finds identical with that external to himself. The Science of Life Let me paint you a picture in the scenic grandeur of the majestic Himalayas with their atmosphere of peace and power. Stands the magnificent retreat, and in the subdued light a man appears, his face aglow as if the sun were shining through it, his presence making one think of vast power being held in control. He stands erect and speaks with a vibrant voice. He looks no more than fifty, but he has seen more than a century past. He is master of the greatest science in the world, the science of life. Let us contrast this with our Western civilization, the clash of arms and social problems, a world racked with fear, insecurity, and distrust. We of the Occidental world have utterly failed to understand the principle of life and have disregarded the things that matter, while being steeped in the illusions created by our minds. Even now we are endeavoring to remedy the effects instead of eliminating the causes. We may well ask ourselves where we are heading, not until we can embrace the Christ principle of living scientifically, collectively, individually, will we be able to look upon the face of the holy man and say, Brother, life abundant, and when I say unto you that I have come, that you shall have more abundant life, that you shall have more incentive for the divine purpose of self-expression and love, wisdom and powerful for the benefit of all, I tell you a truth. After my studies and training in Tibet, the Master said to me, You shall go now into the world, and you shall be our mouthpiece until such a time as we can appear ourselves. People often say to me, Why don't the masters come out now? If they did, do you know what would happen? They would say, Stop this and stop that, and then they would be treated as the Master Christ, with perhaps more modern methods being used. The world does not want the masters. It seems that the mass must learn through suffering before they seek the freedom of truth, but a few may find the freedom now. When I was told to go out in the world and be a mouthpiece for truth, I said, Why choose me? And the answer was, My son, for this you were born. His image and likeness. In the Bible, there is a statement in Genesis. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. The fact is that the same creative spirit that created the universe and all that is in it becomes individualized in man. By that same creative spirit, man thinks and acts. Therefore, according to our thoughts, so shall it be unto us. 
Man has free will to choose, and he uses the same divine power, the same action, and the same mode of expression in creating for himself, as the Creator used in creating the universe. As you sow, so shall ye reap. We must realize the mighty truth that the very essence of our being is divine in nature. Man does not change by time, nor does he change by willpower. Man changes only because he accepts and lives the Christ life. Unless ye have the mind that was in Christ, ye cannot be like him. In the Garden of Eden there are two trees. One is the tree of life. The other is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. How simple the whole thing is. The one is the tree of life, that divine principle in man, and the other is the tree of knowledge, man's intellect. What he believes to be true may be false. He creates images in his own mind, and the law is that which he sees he creates, good for good, detriment for detriment, to exist within the confines of his own life. We are eating of such fruit today. Thou shalt not eat of the fruit, lest thou die in thy sin. And it said, Man's salvation is to take hold of the tree of life, and that to him will be a spring of living water leading up to eternal life. Man, then, sees the perfect divinity within himself. He sees the creative power within him as a divine principle. He allows this life principle to manifest truly and perfectly through him, and he said, I and the Father are one. The Father's will is done in me. The Christ is our example. Think deeply upon this. Let it always be. What would Christ do in this and that circumstance? I am the life. Life alone liveth. God is the only life within each being. The fact that we live is proof that God lives in and through us. Therefore, I am the life. When Jesus was teaching his disciples, Philip said to him, But Master, show us the Father. And Jesus said, Philip, have I been talking to you all this time, and you know not what I say? When you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Do you understand that God alone lives? Take hold of this tree of life, and let it be a spring of living water leading up to eternal life. We create images in our mind. We try to make the truth conform to some idea we have in mind, but the truth is neither an image, nor an idea, nor a sensation. It is not what it is, but that it is, an expression of the one life. I am the life. When you have seen me, you have seen the Father. It is the whole truth, because it is one completeness, wholeness. This is the essential thing in our lives. The Master's teaching gives us the secret of our own inheritance, reveals to us the purpose for which we are here, reveal the beauty of truth, the pearl of great price. Love ye one another, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We must cease to criticize our loved ones. How much love is lost by sharp tongue, criticizing, condemning, with the same energy, how much love could be expressed? What cooperation could be fostered? What peace and harmony attain? If we want to be happy, let us make Christ our pattern. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added. With this attitude, a happiness so tremendous will rise within our soul as to dissolve all that mars and jars in life. It will be an ever new joy expressing itself with every beat of the heart. Then love ye one another. For love is the core of individual and world reconstruction. The world today. Today the world is quarreling over how it shall live. But this is not a new quarrel. It is old as communal life. For though the century history reveals man's age-long struggle for freedom, the right to live, perhaps it may be that man has caught a vision of enduring freedom that makes the struggle so fierce today. The effects we are witnessing today are but the cause of yesterday, and no matter how we treat these effects, it will not cure the trouble in the world of ours. Nor can we separate ourselves from it or close our eyes to the sorrow, conflict, and confusion in our midst, because we are part of it. In fact, we have been contributing towards it by our selfishness, craving and desires, all our energy being directed towards things. And what is this conflict about but things? We try to make ourselves secure at the expense of our brother, dog-eat-dog. -dog. The world is spiritually bankrupt. Our internal poverty causes us to crave for things, and when we have them, there is a fear of loss. And so we are involved in conflict and suffering. It is our, the people's responsibility, whether or not our actions will lead to another war that would make this one look like a Sunday school picnic. Is there a remedy? Yes, there is, and the Master points the way. The Light 
It is essentially individual in character because the individual must see the light before it can be established in the world, and we can become the light. The sincere student is becoming that light. Let your light shine before all men. We must live by example and not by preaching. The world is now trying to solve the peace problem by dividing the nations into two armed camps. One is the have-alls and the other is the want-alls. Really, there is very little difference between them. But the foundation of war is not the foundation of peace. We cannot have lasting peace looking down the barrel of a gun or at the point of a bayonet. It is only by free, systematic, unselfish, cooperative tackling of the cause of war that the cause of war can be eradicated. It is only when we love and assist each other, instead of fearing and hating, that we can hope to banish our self-created misery and suffering. Only by cooperative tackling of the problems of peace and prosperity in the spirit of fellowship and camaraderieship can we hope to have a lasting peace and security free from conflict, sorrow, and limitation. If the present colossal sacrifice of life is to be justified in the name of democracy, then let us leave no stone unturned in founding a democracy by first making ourselves true democrats. Jesus Christ was the truest of all democrats. The Sermon on the Mount is the only true foundation for the real world democracy, and this true democracy has not yet been tried individually or collectively. Our needs are dual in nature, individual and collective. Collectively, we need a system of trade and finance that will serve the people of the world and not enslave them, that will prevent wars and not promote them. Individually, we must cease to exploit our fellow beings and become more helpful to others and less self-seeking. We must see that radio, press, and travel are utilized to foster good international relationships and not cause dissension by hostile propaganda. Personally, let our tongues cease to criticize others, take the plank out of our own eye, before we can see how to take the splinter out of our brother's eye, fits the occasion. Health. We need a system of health based upon spiritual, mental, and natural laws. A system that will spend more time in showing how to live healthy lives and happy lives, not one that spends nearly all its time on the study of disease. It is useless trying to eliminate the effect of disease. We must remove the cause, and this may not be so difficult as most people think, when the laws are properly understood by each and every one of us. Christ removed the cause, and we must do it likewise. He is our example. The things I do, greater things shall ye do, if you will but believe. It is not listening to the word, but acting on the word that counts. Education. We need a system of education that is based upon human culture and not upon cramming a system which will make the coming generation fit the true democracy for which we are striving. Adult education is most essential, for our minds are full of useless facts and contradictions so that we can no longer able to think constructively. We could think when we were children. The questions we then asked prove this fact. But we lose the art when we went to school or we were told by our parents not to ask such questions. The reason, perhaps, being our parents did not know the answers, and so our ignorance has been perpetuated. Today are there are few people or few adults who can think properly. We are unable to discern deeply or become aware of the force of our own thinking, and we are therefore caught up in the net of our own craving, reaction, desire, jealousies, and fears, which bring sorrow and conflict not only to ourselves but to the world, for in fact we are the world, and world reconstruction must begin with ourselves now. Religion We need a religion that is based on love, unity, and brotherly feeling, and not on differing creeds, cults, organizations, things that do not matter. The pearl of truth that gives rise to religion has been submerged by sanctimonious formalities, petty jealousies, and words that mean nothing. A master told me in the Himalayas to be careful not to fall into the error of trying to organize religion. He said, reveal a plain truth so that the individual can grasp it and free himself from confusion. He told me the story of the disciple and the devil when walking together one day happened to see someone picking something up. The devil said to the disciple, did you see that person picking that up? It was a bit of the truth. Is that so, said the disciple? That's just too bad for you, devil. Oh no, said the devil, I'll just wait until he organizes it. The majority in this world are vainly seeking immortality. But when we know we are immortal, this craving and seeking for immortality ceases. And then there is security, peace, love, and understanding. He who seeks to save his soul alone may find the path, but will not reach the goal. 
But he who loves may wander far, yet God will bring him where the blessed are. It is unworthy of any soul to seek privileges for himself, because those who do are not fulfilling the law. Christ fulfilled the law by fulfilling the will of the Father in establishing the well-being of the Father's children on earth. Human welfare. We, you and I, must see to it that persons or groups of persons who have not the welfare of humanity at heart and do not understand spiritual worth shall not have any place in the scheme of things, nationally or internationally. We can no longer waste our time in patching up old, worn-out systems, creeds, or cults. They have outlived their usefulness, that have failed miserably in the past, nor can we wait for others to show us the way. We must realize that nothing can stand the tide of our united will because God is with us. His plan, His power, His wisdom, His love. Each one of us must seek immediate action fired by our divine, dynamic, united purpose. Each and every one of us must devote our energies to the constructive work of building a new and better world of permanent health, happiness, security, and peace for the brotherhood of all mankind. And this begins with ourselves, in our immediate association, in our homes, in our business, and in our everyday life. Now is the time for the reconstruction of the individual and the nation, for only faith, sincerity, and love for humanity earn divine protection. Individuality, we must take every opportunity of training ourselves spiritually, mentally, and physically in the science of living, so that each and every one of us can make a real contribution to the establishment of a better order of things. But what contribution have we made towards a better order of things? We must all accept our responsibility as world citizens and direct our brain power and efforts towards the emancipation of humanity in the belief that every individual has a right to security and freedom, to enjoy health, knowledge, and the riches of culture, that henceforth the world's assets shall be harvested for the constructive use and benefit to serve mankind and not for our enslavement, that love for others more than love for ourselves shall dominate our action. For love is that strong, vigorous, manly expression of the Christ character. Time does not change man. Willpower does not change man. Only the Christ character can do that. The Master said, If you love only those who love you, what credit is that to you? Jesus the Christ lived to make man holy. Let us live to make man free. Let us follow the light of his ideal, for he showed man how to live. He gave to the world a way of life which it adopted would lead us into a new world of peace and plenty. His disciples saw the light and followed it. Let us resolve now to turn towards it, and in our hearts write these inspired words uttered by that immortal poet, Robert Burns. It's coming yet for a that, that man to man the world over, shall brothers be for that. End of talk.